Hello again. I'm excited to be here with you once more. My name is Jeff Little and I serve as Senior Associate Leader of Disciple Making Movements and House Churches. I always love seeking the Lord for what He wants to say to His people and then sharing His heart real time with you. It is a great joy of mine to open God's Word and show you wonderful things within it. If you started with us last week, you'll know that God put a series in my heart called Discipling 101 regarding the biblical baseline understandings of God's calling for each of us to make disciples that make disciples. Or as we say around here, building solid lives that build solid lives. Now, I like a big idea as much as the next guy, but I honestly just simply prayed and asked God what to say, and he gave me this. The fact that it aligns with the role out of Jesus' disciple is merely a bonus, but I'm certain it's a part of God's plan. I really just want to convey here that this isn't a coordinated synergistic plan, but rather a move of God. So I do hope your hearts are open to receive again from the Lord today. But before we look to receive from God, it's good to worship Him. One way we do that is to show Him that we trust Him by bringing back the tithe to Him, that first 10% of your income. And because of the incredible revelation God has given in creating Jesus Disciple and our upcoming Jesus Disciple Conference next week, you have an opportunity to sow in faith to see the gospel not only be preached, but also training and vibrant inspiration to come to would-be disciplers everywhere, even before you see it. <laughs> Anyone remember Thomas? I won't believe it until I stick my hand in the man's sides and poke my fingers in the nail holes. Don't be Thomas. Instead, attune your ears and your heart to God's call to sow into this incredible Jesus Disciple ministry. Let me share with you a couple more short testimonies from those who have been beta testing the bugs out of this for us. One says, During Jesus Disciple, I've been baptized, and the Lord set in motion many great commitments in my life to share and spread the good news. Another says, my life changed by having more boldness to speak the gospel, more confidence. As we come upon this Jesus Disciple Conference, know that there's not only going to be incredible main event speakers, but also several breakouts. I'll even be there. I want to meet you. So come, come, come. If you can get to this Jesus Disciple Conference, join us. Now, as we give above the tithe today towards Jesus Disciple, here's a reminder how it works. We bring God's tithe back to Him first. Then, in a separate transaction, we start again. Select Jesus Disciple Fund and give the amount He puts on your heart. Simple. Let me thank you for your openness and your obedience to the Lord in making this possible to get out to the world. By the way, we're starting with both English and Spanish. Jesus Disciple right from the start, multilingual, with plans for many more languages and seasons to come. Your support helps us spread this great commission training farther and farther across the globe. Let me pray for you before we give. Our Father in heaven, we come to you again knowing that you have um, the most amazing plans. You're ready to roll out so many things that are beyond our imagination. But Lord, we want to partner with you in the ways that you call us to. The things that we can see, Lord, we want to say yes to. And so we do it in faith, in trust, in love, and in hope, knowing that this hope is not disappointing. Lord, you are going to accomplish your word. You're, you're watching over it to perform it. And you said it needs to get out to everyone. We're trying. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to partner with you to see this expand and reach the nations that we are commissioned to go and disciple. I pray a blessing over everyone who gives today, not only in the honoring you of bringing back the tithe, but Lord, and also the free will, generous love offerings that are given to the Jesus Disciple Fund. Help us to reach the world with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Giving to the Rock Network or Solid Lives is easy. For the safety of our leaders and attendees, all giving in house churches is done electronically. We never collect physical offerings. The most convenient way to give is through one of our apps. You can download either the Rock app or the Solid Lives app on your app store. For the Rock app, just search for Go to the Rock. And for the Solid Lives app, search for Solid Lives. You can also easily give through one of our websites, either go to the rock.com or solidlives.com. 
on either the app or the website. Simply click Give and then select House Churches. Then choose your state and city or state or city not listed. Thank you so much for honoring God and partnering with us to build solid lives that build solid lives. Welcome back to Discipling 101. This one I'm calling Getting in the Way. Let me start out with a quick geometry lesson. Every square is a rectangle, but not every rectangle is a square. It's true. And I don't say that just to impress you. <laughs> You're like, good, because so far, you're in no danger of impressing anybody. Aha! But here's why I bring it up. Because we've talked about Jesus expecting every follower of his to make disciples. So try this on for size. All disciples are Christians, but not all Christians are disciples. Not all Jesus disciples anyway. It's worth some self-reflection. We'll make some time to discuss this openly among yourselves at the conclusion of this message. In Acts 24, Paul discusses this group of Jesus followers as the way. Is that you? Maybe, because this is church after all, we can safely assume we're all believers in Jesus. If not, not a problem. And if your heart is stirred today to join the family of God, just talk to someone in your gathering before you leave. So for our purposes here, let's say we all believe. Check. But there's this nagging scripture in James 2 verse 19 that says, you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you believe, but even the demons believe. So are, are we saying that we're on the same page? Believing is not enough. God knows that the demons believe 100%, but at least they have the good sense to tremble, knowing that they are absolutely not going to heaven when he wraps this whole thing up, even though they totally believe. Do you feel a twinge of unease at any of this? I know I do. Allow me to continue paving this road, walking you through what it takes to fulfill Jesus' expectations of his followers. Consider Philippians 2, 12 to 13, where Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. What? We're supposed to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling? Yes. <laughs> and notice that the apostle is speaking to beloved disciples who have always obeyed. Look, I didn't write that in your Bible. It's right there. They've always obeyed. And he's still telling them, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I don't know about you, but right about now, I'm thinking something along the lines of, uh, I haven't always obeyed. <laughs> so where does that leave me? Come on, are you thinking that too? The humility required to live in this reality of our humanity is something. Remember, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble in James 4, 6. What I want for you is for you to be absolutely assured of your salvation and humble enough to continue working it out with fear and trembling. It's a strange tension once you acknowledge it, but by God's grace through faith, we'll win our race and obtain the prize. This isn't a one and done proposition. Yeah, I said that prayer that one time, remember? With every head bowed and every eye closed as if it was a great cosmic secret, something nearly shameful and private. You see, this isn't how it works. And you can tell I have some strong feelings about that man-made approach to entering the kingdom of God. Both Mark and Luke's Gospels record Jesus saying plainly, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You don't want Jesus being ashamed of you. Let's not be ashamed of him. Salvation is a glorious thing. Entering the kingdom and the family of God, come on. Joining the priesthood of believers, yoking up with Jesus, living sacrificially for him every day, devotedly pursuing his great commission to make disciples of all nations. This is the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no getting in some other way. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. He proceeds to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. You think you're getting in without me? You're fooling yourself. 
Is it possible that we are too casual about the Christianity we espouse? Could we be deceiving ourselves into thinking we're following Jesus pretty good, but we actually aren't? There's this other harrowing passage of scripture that I want to draw out and really chew on together. And look, I'm not trying to scare you or beat you up. If anything, I just want us all to have a clear picture of reality according to the Lord's words. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. At least three times in the Bible, we read the words, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans 10, 9, we read, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Listen, these are true scriptures, but if we're not careful, we can miss their full meaning. Note that they don't say, If you confess or call on the name of the Savior Jesus, you'll be saved. So many people want a Savior, but they don't want a Lord. They want the rescue, but not the relationship. Hey, I said the prayer. I called on Jesus to save me. Now I'm saved. The end. But it's not the end. It's only the beginning. And by calling on the Lord, you are invoking covenant lordship, which means he owns you now and forever. And you're glad to be owned by your loving Lord and Savior, Jesus, because he isn't abusive or domineering. He's simply the way, the truth, the life the only way, the only truth, the only life. And if you want him, you got him. But not just his blessings devoid of relationship. In Luke 6, we know this very well. Jesus said, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? How are you going to call me Lord and not do what I say? Back to Matthew 7, he says, I never knew you. That's relational. He wants family. In John 14, verse 21, Jesus says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him, he who does not love me does not keep my words. Jesus wants to manifest himself among his people, and he makes a distinction between the world and the kingdom. Those not in relationship with him don't get the covenant blessings of intimacy with the Lord. And he's just fine with that because the invitation is open to everyone. Anyone can come to Jesus at any time and be adopted into the family, but most choose not to. If you love me, you will do what I say, Jesus says. <laughs> that's not me, that's Jesus. And if we do what he says, we show that we love him, and he would never be unjust to forget our work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister, Hebrews 6.10 says. He wouldn't say, depart from me, I never knew you. He's trying to bring us to himself for all eternity. All that I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And just in case you don't realize who was shocked at that pronouncement of, depart from me, I never knew you, it was people who thought they were believers. How do we know? Because look at what they say to Jesus. Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many wonders in your name? Like, Jesus, we did all the stuff and it worked. What do you mean you don't know me? I'm your plus one. You got to let me in. Jesus responds with, of course the miracles happened. My name always works, but I never knew you. You never gave me your heart, your life, your decisions, your surrender. You just used my power with the authority you have on earth as a human, throwing my name around to get stuff done. But I always wanted to be one with you, and you didn't want that. Hebrews 11.6 says, He who comes to God must believe that he is, 
and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Where was the diligent seeking of my face, my heart, and not just what was in my hands? Where was your heart and not just your hands? You got a hand out all the time, but I want to be with you. Remember Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha? Luke 10, 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. I don't know if she said it with that much attitude, but let's just read it that way. Don't you care? Tell her to help me. And, and Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Jesus came to town to spend time with his friends, and we see two responses. Martha's working, serving, doing tasks, busy, 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 <laughs> but with attitude. I mean, the nerve to speak to Jesus this way. Lord, don't you care? My sister has left me to serve alone. Tell her to help me. I don't know if you're like me, hopefully not in this respect, because this riles me up. If it was me there in that moment and not Jesus, I might have said, I ain't telling her jack. Don't you tell me what to do. <laughs> I tell you what to do. Look, serve or don't serve, but shut up about it. In fact, if you ever talk to me that way again, you, you see what I'm saying? Come on, let's all thank God right now that I'm not Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Look, it's worship time. Let's get back to Scripture. What does Jesus say here with such grace and truth? Come on, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Look, Mary sat at Jesus' feet to diligently listen undistracted to his word, and thus she was able to hear it. You know, like, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Mary's being discipled, and Martha is not. It's clear what Jesus prefers, someone who wants to relate to him and seek him. She realizes she'd been forgiven much, and now she loves much. Maybe Martha didn't have that revelation yet. Let's talk, let's talk about our time. Who realizes that things are pricey these days? Come on. I mean, are you trying to buy a car right now? It's, it's nuts out there. We're trying to get a replacement car, and of course, we can't just jump at any deal on any vehicle. No, we need an eight-seater, because my wife Jen had all these babies. And <laughs> Don't hate on me. I know it takes two. And I'm not keen on paying these multiple thousand dollar markups above MSRP. Are you with me on this? Don't get me started. I'm looking for a discount. I got to know I can afford something. We don't get into debt anymore. That lifestyle is over for us. The borrower is slave to the lender. We're not about to get entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Listen to Jesus in Luke 14, 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he laid the foundation, he's not able to finish. And then all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Look, we need to count the cost of discipleship, the personal cost of following Jesus, and then help others count the cost as well. Again, Jesus didn't say, go make converts or go make some believers. He said, go make disciples. And inherent in the word disciple is disciple maker. Think about it. If Jesus made disciples whose job it is to make other disciples, then the disciples we make are meant to make other disciples. So to be a disciple, you must be a disciple maker. Yeah, 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 but my faith is personal and just between me and Jesus. No, it is not. <laughs> it's a public, fruitful for you and multiplying into others ministry assignment we've been given to carry out in Jesus' name while he's preparing our eternal home with him in heaven. We ain't pumping out no discount disciples over here. Jesus didn't go through everything he went through for some discount bride. <laughs> Just like you and I would want an all-in, committed, loving, and devoted, caring spouse, so does Jesus with you. Are you that kind of spouse to Jesus? that kind of disciple, 
that kind of discipler? Are you actually in the way? No place I'd rather be than here in the way. <laughs> Got to get in the way. We've all discussed this today about getting in the way and not just pretending or, or casually. Jesus won't stand for an open relationship with you. He wants to be your one and only. He's committed himself to you. It is time for us to go all in for Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, we turn our attention to you. You are so good and so loving, and we don't want to two-time you. We don't want to be casual with you. We don't want to, to walk out on you and then try to walk back in and walk out. Lord, we just want to be with you 100%. Forgive us, Lord, when we've been so casual, so self-seeking, and, and not considered your feelings and, and your heart that we've not operated in your love language, which you say is obedience. We know it to be true, but, but sometimes we just, we're frail, we're foolish, we fall and fail, but we don't want to be that anymore. Come on, can you just join me and, and even just mutter that under your breath? I don't want to be like that with you anymore, Jesus. And Lord, as we pray together, we want to link our hearts right back with your heart. We want to do what you say because we know that you have the best plans. They're actually better than all of our plans could be. And so we seek you again today. We ask for the boldness to, to turn from some of that wickedness, from, from that selfishness, from the ways that we have that, that only satisfy ourselves for a short term and they don't satisfy you and they won't satisfy us for all eternity. Lord, help us to become like you, loving compassionate, grace-filled, full of truth. We want to follow you like that. We want to be your disciples, and we want others who follow us and imitate us to become just like you. Help us to do it. We commit ourselves to you today in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I hope you all take some time to reflect and discuss where you've been and where you're going with Jesus. Encourage one another without attacking or condemning. The Holy Spirit has done the convicting work, and now our role as church family is to edify one another. Lovingly hold each other accountable to the moves you're prompted to make over these next weeks, and then watch God at work in your lives and ministries. Do you consider yourself a Christian or a disciple or both? I want you to answer these. Do you consider yourself a Christian? Just a Christian? Maybe a disciple? Both? What evidence supports that answer? Do you need to make any changes in order to follow Jesus more adequately? We're going to give you time in your group to answer these questions. Come on, ask each other. Don't be shy. Use this. This is Discipling 101. I know that you're going to get something out of this. Open your hearts, open your mouths, come on, tell the truth, and, and listen, everybody else, when they're telling the truth, love on them, love on them, help them through this. God's got great plans. I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you.